Chris, so tell us about uh, the fix, what's going on. Uh, you've been at it how many years now? This is 10. Wow, This 10. is one decade. And this must be an exciting time. And, you know, tell us sort of about the growth of the fix. Sure. What's happening now and, and sort of... 10 years on, it's a lot more crowded. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's, uh, it's and, a lot more crowded. You know, so what's the secret? Well, for, tell us about some of your milestones, what's going I on. I mean, I think what you have to do with any product, certainly any content product that exists for 10 years in this kind of changing environment, is you have to m move it to. So when we started The Fix 10 years ago, first of all, it wasn't a we, it was a me. It was just me writing. Um, and I was trying to just break news. That was what I had come from. That was the background I knew. I thought that would be a way to establish myself as someone you needed to read, right? Even then, it was a crowded marketplace. <laughs> Who, no one knew what it would become in 10 years, but it was crowded even then. Um, but then, you know, we, we began adding staff. Um, Aaron Blake, uh, one of the first two people we hired, is still on the team, um, and did a stint as editor, is now back writing. Um, but we started hiring people, and, and as I did that, I again, this is the transition from what to so what and now what. I was doing almost all what, and I thought, gosh, there's a lot of what in this world, and increasingly, the what is determined by what newspapers you want to look at. Like, you know, our competitive advantage in the what is not huge. Um, you could name on one hand the number of people who know who breaks a certain story. It's just reporters and maybe the people related to reporters, and that, that's about it. Um, so I tried to move it much more into an analytical, reported analysis space. That's what we spent the last four or five years on. Um, you know, we've now got a, a guy named Philip Bump who we hired from Adobe, who's you know very non-traditional background but can build anything, and he builds wonderful interactive for us, builds all sorts of really cool stuff on the fly. Um, we have someone covering race and the intersection of race and politics. We have someone covering the intersection of media and politics. We have someone doing Congress. Um, we have Aaron Blake doing accountability. So we've branched into spaces that I think were undercovered as it related to the analytical piece of those. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of news. What news about all of that subject matter and about everything that has even touches politics? But I do think that that. Um, look, it's paid off. Uh, uh, you know, we, we had more page views. We, a six-person staff, had more page views than, the, than Politico, which is a staff, editorial staff of well over 100 uh, in July, which is obviously a big month given the conventions. A lot of eyeball, political eyeballs on it. Um, I think the reason for that is uh, analytical, focus on so what, now what, have fun in some order. Have fun. Be able to laugh at yourself. Write in a way that is accessible. Don't worry about the inverted pyramid. Write for the internet. Um, you know, be a, be an internet native writing for the internet. So, and a lot of it is, I, I would also say, a huge dose of luck and being in the right place at the right time and working for a big news organization that is now owned by an internet, you know, internet pioneer uh, who understands the importance of digital uh, and understands the way in which information moves uh, in this sort of uh, content economy. So, I mean, it's been a lot of right place at the right time. It's not as though I've strategically plotted all these things out, but I would say a commitment to focusing on not just the breaking of the news, transitioning it from a breaking news blog to an analytical blog, I think has been the, the sort of centerpiece of why we've succeeded. And Chris, finally, uh, this is a sort of an interesting uh, campaign season. <laughs> and That uh, is a good word so for it. So untraditional with Mrs. Clinton not doing press conferences, mm -hmm. Mr. Trump uh, barring certain publications from his yep. events, and us. all sorts of um, ground rules that are completely different. Uh, what w a book will be written. I don't know if you're going to buy it. I think a <laughs> lot of books will be written. Uh, I'm sure several are already being written. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I've said to anyone who asks that w w whether Donald Trump wins or loses, we will be talking about him in political science circles 20 years from now, for sure, maybe 50 or 100 years from now, in terms of what, did, what does and did this candidacy mean? How did someone with that background who approached the campaign in what, what can only be described as a decidedly unorthodox manner, how did he beat what was a quality field. A lot of people like to, you know, in, in hindsight, like to run the field down. Like you're talking about the sitting governor of Ohio, a Florida senator who's widely viewed as a rising star. Ditto the senator from Texas, Ted Cruz. Jeb Bush, member of the Republican royalty. Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey. Like, th these are not, this is not the 2012 field when it was kind of like Mitt Romney and those other guys, right? This is a real serious field. Now, there were <laughs> 17 people running, so you, you could have your pick of whoever you wanted, but the fact, how, how did this happen? Given that he spent the least money of any 
of the serious candidates. He ran the least ads of any of the serious candidates. He had the worst organization of any of the serious candidates. How, how did we get here? What does it say about us as a country, the Republican Party as a party, uh, the future of the Republican Party? So, I, I mean, I do think that no matter what happens, um, two things will happen. One, we will have a reckoning within the Republican Party of what did this all mean, even if he wins. I mean, if he wins, I think it will be a reckoning within the country. What does this say about us? If he loses, it'll be a, within the party. What did he mean? Is this a one-off or not? And if she wins, uh, I, you know, I'm nearly certain we will head for gr uh, gridlock at a level we've not seen e even within these last five or 10 years, which have been among the most gridlocked in history, which is she would be elected as the least popular per president given her numbers, as would Trump, the least popular president ever to win. Um, likely a divided Congress, even if Democrats take back the Senate, the House seems close to impenetrable for Republicans. So if you thought the last two years was bad, I would say just wait. Now, um, do I think that predictions like Michelle Bachman, the former congressman, former presidential candidate, that this will be the last election are overly dire? Yes. Uh, politics, and American politics in particular, has a way of figuring itself out over time. We work on very narrow time scales, particularly in this day and age of Twitter and things happening every two seconds. But if you look at the broad scope of history, there have been times when Republicans were Senate and times when Democrats were Senate and times in which it was just deeply polarized. So it, it will work itself out. What I would say is I don't think anyone knows how, but that to me is the intriguing part, right? How do we figure this out where it seems as though the country is just absolutely in these two separate camps, never the twain shall meet. We, we, history would suggest we'll figure it out. I just don't know how, but the covering of the process of how to me is totally fascinating.